What's up, gang? We're back at HQ. It's a new week. We're gonna do some comp bench today. Hit a nice juicy single. Do some close grip bench, close-ish grip bench. Um, what else? We're gonna do some chin-ups because pull-ups are stupid. Sorry, Mike, I'm just not gonna do them. Uh, and then we'll do some wall sits for the knees. And hopefully soon we can start doing some squats and deadlifts with a little more than, you know, 70 or 80 kilos, but it's a process, you know, you can't rush it. Just gotta try to be smart. My knees are feeling really good though. I got to do some leg extensions at my dad's in the garage, the garage, Crawdaddy's House of Muscle, I like to call it, the dojo, AKA the dojo. And that was good, did dips for the first time in like a decade. They felt good, actually. A lot of people talk about how dips destroy their shoulders, but I liked them. And uh, yeah, that's today. We'll see you there. You can click off if you want. You don't have to watch anything you don't want to watch. I oh, let's go. I oh, let's go. I oh, let's go. I oh, let's go. The moment is. So I have a question of the day for you. Good. I might have a, multiple questions of the days this week. We'll see. Hit me. Let's go. This one comes from Skaz Skaz. Ooh, Skaz Skaz. Uh, he says, not big or particularly nuanced question, <clears throat> but what actually was your OG hip injury? The OG hip injury. That's not a bigger nuanced question. Um, so, about 2015, my hips started bothering me at lockout on squats. Uh, that was most notably where I felt it. I also started feeling it in the lockout of my conventional deadlifts, and that eventually led to me switching to sumo. It also led to my squat progression being pretty rough from 2015 till now. Uh, so in terms of symptoms, it's basically just a sharp shoot like not shooting sharp stabbing pain at lockout in sort of the top third of my squat and it was in the top third of my deadlift as well now that i pull sumo if it shows up there it's usually right off the floor now for years and years i never had any kind of diagnosis i had no idea what exactly was wrong it seemed like i could walk in squat i could do everything outside of the gym and never ever feel it until I got up past about 220 kilos, at which point, in a lot of cases, I started feeling it. Some days I'd go in and squat and I'd have zero issues, zero pain whatsoever. Uh, fast forward six or seven years and I have pretty consistent pain of varying degrees. Generally, once I can get some training in, whether that be from training really light for a while or using a very slow tempo, you'll often see me lock out really slow sometimes when my hips bugging me. 
But uh, if I can get some training on it, it generally kind of goes away and feels better. Now I had MRI, di-injected MRI on my hip and my back. I had ultrasound, I had chiropractors, I had physios, I had traditional Chinese medicine uh, acupuncture, I had dry needling, I've had massage, I've had all of the things under the sun that you could spend your money on if you're trying to, uh, you know, fix your injuries. The only thing that ever worked was basically just unloading the bar, putting on less weight and progressing back up. Now recently I had a meeting with Sam Spinelli and he, I think, maybe gave me the closest thing to a diagnosis I've had and that is that it's a, it's a tendinopathy. It's a, a tendinosis, tendinitis, tendinitis, tendinitis. Uh, it's a tendinopathy of some kind where and the, the reason I think that might be a decent diagnosis is because that seems to fall in line with how it happens, right? Like I said, if I can train it, it feels better. But generally, my training blocks are like six to seven weeks of loading, and then I have a, a deload or a washout. Almost always when I come back after a deload or a washout, it's much worse. So generally speaking with treatment for tendinopathies, you want to continue doing the loading, continue doing the thing that's affecting it positively for up to 16 weeks, maybe more, to ensure that there's actually some kind of change in the tissues, some kind of change in the adaptation. So if it is a tendinopathy, that explains a lot. Now, he wasn't certain, and neither am I, but that's the closest I've gotten to any kind of uh, diagnosis of it. And with the abduction plank exercises and raises and stuff, I can very much feel that right in where the injury hurts. And I've never had any exercises that I've been able to kind of suss out like, oh, this is exactly where my hip hurts when it hurts. So hopefully there's uh, you know, some efficacy there. Hopefully there's some success and some lessening of symptoms, but that's the long and short or maybe the long and long of my injury, my hip injury, the OG. All right, to get you up to speed, Tuesday, was a pretty quick little session. I did the filming, so you can thank me for all the great angles, things potentially being out of focus, etc. cetera. Uh, just some quick, like, I don't know, rehab deadlifts. I think I deadlifted maybe 90 kilos plus change. So I, I think that comes out to about 120 at the top. So uh, we're getting there. If I go slow, it feels good. It doesn't hurt at all. So that's really good. No reaction from my knee afterwards. Um, so also really good there. And then the rest of the day was just some rows and went through my rehab exercises, which I don't think we filmed. So uh, yesterday we went to Huge Life. We checked out the leg extension leg curl that we're gonna get. Because I had such a good experience last weekend with the knee extensions, my knee felt whew, so good afterwards. Uh, we're gonna get one of those and bring it in here. And hopefully that'll be within the next couple days because I'd really like to start implementing that on my rehab days. And today is gonna to be some really light squats, probably maybe 80 kilos, 90 kilos if I feel great. Very, very slow stuff again. And we're gonna do some close grip bench. That should be relatively heavy. And some dumbbell bench. Hopefully that's okay on the shoulders. We don't have any way to do dips really, so uh, we'll stick with those. And I think chest supported rows today. So uh, we're doing it all on stream like we normally do if you guys are interested. If y'all are interested, come by on Fridays. Uh, Dylan finished wiping the floor with everyone Calgary Barbell adjacent that plays Street Fighter. So if you play Street Fighter, you want to come beat up on Dylan, stop by the stream. Anyways, let's get started. Yeah, yeah. 
<clears throat> hey, we're here again. How's it going? I'm good, man. How are we're you doing? We're here again. This is the first time we've been here. We're always here, man. <laughs> we're always here. Never anywhere else. Home number two. Making this place homey. Yeah, we just need bunk beds. Yeah, and dog bunk beds. I think Selena's still kind of annoyed that we don't have those yet. <laughs> the three-layered dog bunk beds. I've been uh, I've been looking for dog beds, but uh, you dog know, bunk I'm, beds. Just dog beds in general. I'm really you picky. Need to narrow the search to bunk beds. I think. Yeah. A little ramp to walk up. Be very cute. Will Bronson like that though? He'll go underneath <laughs> on the bottom probably, or on the top because he thinks he's a giant dog. So speaking. <laughs> Sorry, bro. I was Sorry. just gonna say, tell me what's the what's the tea this week? What's the tea? Yeah. Um, as the kids say, the tea this week. Probably the biggest piece of news would be the IPF uh, bench rule changes, actually becoming a thing. Yep. Um, real lack of communication, uh, yep. other than you know a bunch of rumors and Instagram stories, and then all of a sudden, ta-da! Here we go. <laughs> um, but. I don't know. I, I went through a real salty like day about it where I was just furious. Uh, and then I realized that I was being really annoying and annoying myself with my reaction <laughs> to it and just feeling unnecessarily negative. So I think the counter play is that we make a video, not about my opinion about it, but a video that outlines Here's what the rules say. Here's what the pictures are. Here's our best interpretation of some of the things that maybe could use some clarification. Yeah. Also, here are the things that need some clarification, probably. Uh, and you know, here's what it means for you as a lifter. Here's what it means for you as a coach. Here's what it means for you as a referee, and those kinds of things. And and try to use it as a resource to open it up to people a little bit because a lot of us are going to be even in small ways impacted by this with the setup rule, for example, you know, my bench probably isn't one of the benches targeted, but I will have to set up differently now. So I think it's going to mean a lot of different things to different people. And if we can provide a resource, I think that's way more valuable than me going off about my opinion on it. So I think we'll try to get that video out probably the same week this comes out. Can you provide a resource though? There's some of the rules are a bit, uh, so like, I looked a little bit more into it this morning and it seems like there's a bit of a discrepancy between what's listed word wise and what's shown in pictures. Yeah. Cause the words of the like bench depth rules specifically, they mentioned the lowest part of the elbow and the top part of the shoulder. Yeah. And if, if you're looking at it in terms of lines, most benches are, are all going to be there. So Even some I'm of the like, ones they showed that were bad examples, but what they did in the images was they used like circles. So if I'm like way below parallel, that means I don't have to touch my chest, right? Like I, I think, can just yeah. like- I think that's the <laughs> counter argument is like, if your arms are past a certain length, you should get uh, like some sort of or... allotment, allowment yeah. or allowance for like a one board, yeah. right? Yeah. I don't know. That'd I think sweet. like if we really want to try to standardize stuff like that, Somebody spend some money and use some friggin laser beams. You know what I mean? Yeah Use some kind of standardized like squat depth bench depth laser thing Get special elbow sleeves knee sleeves, whatever if that's something that people Like if that's something we want to be that gung-ho on let's maybe take some of this burden off referees because especially in bench There's a thousand things that the referees are looking at well, yeah, how do you, exaggeration. But. How do you look for like a touch? And also elbow the depth. touch, the head on the bench, uh, no change from elected start position, which now incorporates the appropriate amount of the butt grip being within the rings. Make sure you're covering the, the rings. rings. Make sure the feet don't move too much. Yeah, the feet can move, but not too much. And usually the ring thing is missed all the time. Like I see I've people... seen a few people get away with some some heinous yeah. uh, abuse of that rule and, and way outside the rings. Yeah, and I think. I don't think that's because the head ref was an idiot. I think it's just because there's so much to look for and so much to be conscious of when you're refereeing. So yeah. adding to that burden, I think is, is tricky, It'll especially be, uh, when volunteers are often already quite scarce for running competitions. It'd be really interesting, but I guess I would say the rules are probably more favorable towards you 
because your depth is already there. But I also feel like a lot of 120s. I don't think there's a lot of 120s with like a like super crazy arch and yeah, yeah. with a really short bench depth. Yeah. You know, I don't think in my weight class that's really a thing. I think you'll see probably some big shakeups in the lightweight classes. Yeah, you know the Eddie Berglunds out there are yeah. going to be disproportionately impacted. But you know that's essentially who the rule was aimed at, I guess. So in a weird way and on a positive kind of positive side, I guess, is it just makes things interesting to see for the first year what happens. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know if that means they're going to have to reset records or yeah. what that's going to be. There's a lot of conversations to be had about it, I think. Um, yeah. But yeah, just... Uh, it's, been, it's been a bit beaten to death in the news. The, stay the tuned Instagram powerlifting news cycle lately, though, so... Yeah. What other tea do we have? Well, we've been outfitting HQ, mm -hmm. and we have some other additions to HQ coming. Yep. So... When we put this place together, we had a lot of help from Bells of Steel. Shoutouts, Bells of Steel, Min, Cave On. Um, and then we realized, okay, we want to get some other like equipment uh, of certain varieties coming in here. So uh, we went to Huge Life and we went to see our, 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 our now buddy Cody there. Uh, and we started, that's where we got our seated row. Uh, that's where we got our leg press. And then just recently, we got our leg extension leg curl from there, and you'll see yeah. that in the video. Uh, that's a, a pretty damn nice piece of equipment. Pretty happy with it so far. Especially for like the side, the space that it saves because it's two in one. Yeah, it's a, it's a small footprint for what it is, yeah. which is nice. Um, we won an auction this morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Spinal, yep. uh, the username. Shh, they can't was know. The, <laughs> they can't know. <laughs> Just bleep that out. Um, anyways, we were the highest bidder. We got a. We got a chest press for about half the price they asked for when we went to try to buy it before auction. Yeah. So that's very, very good, very yeah. exciting. And we've been chatting with Aleka about getting a new comp bench and plate set. Yeah. Which I think we're gonna pull the trigger on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. But what makes an Aleko rack worth it? So the rack for me, the biggest thing is the bench pad. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that it's not upholstered, it's a hard sort of, Maybe not hard. It's a it's a plastic. It's like a rubbery plastic, and there's texture built in to the upper part of the bench where your shoulders would go. So how does that get worn out over time? I don't know. Does it? <laughs> or like, would they like? Would is you... that something that needs to be replaced? That's a good question. I honestly don't know. Yeah. I don't know if I know anybody who's had one that's been in use for a number of years because it's a relatively new design. Yeah. Um, one of the other benefits is that these uprights move in and out just with a simple lever. Mm -hmm. So if you have to go in and out, that's a lot easier. Part of it for me is that A, I really like the bench and B, that's the bench I'm going to be benching on when it comes to competition. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's the biggest thing for me is having that comp spec and I like it. I think it looks good. <laughs> I like Aleko stuff. I think their stuff looks really good. I think the safeties are good for like it's more safe than a Leica or an ER rack because it's bolted in yeah like if these sort of and they do tend to come away from the rack and then you can get stuck they leave a hole in between the uh, the safety and the upright yeah it's a little, little sketchy so sometimes. you have to worry a little bit less about that but I mean we we have these huge blocks here so truth that also helps but I guess we can keep the ER rack maybe with these blocks mm -hmm. and then the Leica will be on its own have its own I mean that's these blocks are are mainly for squatting right yeah. because these safeties even the Aleco ones are not going to catch a squat yeah uh, and are, aren't built to yeah right if you see the racks in competition they take these safeties completely out and you know the the contingency plan is that the bar hits the floor and hopefully it's not on top of the lifter yeah so um, but yeah, and also plates, right? We've been having more people come and train here lately. It's been really nice. You'll see in my footage from Saturday yep. uh, that we had like a big crew in here on Saturday. I think Danny brought four or five lifters um, and Brian and Alexa, and there were a number of other people. Dan came by at the end and it yep. was just, you know, it, it was awesome having that many people in here. Yeah. Luckily, most people were lifting in like the one, 20 range i'd say it like the as a top end maybe 170 or whatever yeah but uh if anybody had been lifting any heavier we would have run out of plates for sure and yeah. even with some of the change plate things because we only have one pair 
of kilo change plates in you know anything below 25. So having more of that, I think, opens us up to host better, to have more people here lifting and be able to supply them with weights. Well, it's interesting because my perspective as someone who doesn't compete, doesn't care to compete, like I'll lift with pound plates, kilo plates, whatever. So like to me, I would just buy whatever's cheapest, most like money safe <laughs> or mm. budget friendly. Yeah. Um, but I like I do understand, like I like the look of the Leco plates. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, I'm like, I don't know what makes yeah, it Yeah, I don't it. really know what makes them, you know, a better comp plate. I don't know if a better comp plate exists outside of being more accurate. Yeah. Like maybe that's the thing. I think they scratch less than what we have. They seem then, to be more resilient for sure. Yeah, yeah better yeah. paint. Yeah, I mean those those challenge plates are. Uh, they, the, I mean, granted, they've looked like that since the day I unpacked them. Pretty much, you know, they like chip to a certain degree, and then it's just they're invincible because all the paint that's there is somehow just bonded using magic. Yeah. But they do get pretty beat up looking. So, yeah, I don't know. I think the plate thing for me is just, yeah, as long as they're calibrated, as long as they're accurate and i guess one of the other advantages is that you can actually use aleco, aleco plates in competition yeah right the challenge plates might be the right weight but you can't use them in competition because they're not a approved brand yeah so when like making a gym what kind of things do you consider when budgeting for equipment well i mean you kind of said the answer in the question there budget right is obviously a huge thing is what you're going to spend your money on what you're willing to spend more or less on mm -hmm. you know we could have definitely gotten cheaper dumbbells yep for example but we shelled out and we got the nice ivanka ones because we thought they look good and they feel good yeah and they're durable and they're not really going to depreciate you know what i mean but we didn't get the Aleco, or sorry, the, the Ivanko dumbbell racks. Yeah. We got cheap dumbbell racks. Yeah. Um, I think it also kind of comes down to like what like gives you joy. Like what do you like what using? What brings you joy? Yeah. <laughs> Dylan it... asked me this morning, he, goes, he said, does holding an Aleco plate bring you joy? <laughs> I was like, yeah. So does holding a different brand of Kilo plate bring you joy? And I was like, well, maybe not as much. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's important because sometimes it's the little things that can make you enjoy your training just just a little bit more and make it that much better. Sometimes you can use a little boost you can get. Yeah. The other thing that I would say uh, with laying out a gym would be the space, right? Mm -hmm. Thinking about how much space you have for what, how crowded you want it to be. Like I know Garrett's gym, for example, is just like a hundred thousand machines just kind of like on top of each other. But that's the vibe there, you know what I mean? Like, he just has everything. Garrett from Barry Barbell Club. Yeah, I don't know, you mentioned this before, but you were talking about like you get a, an interior designer. But I think like the vibe, I think figuring out if you're gonna be a place that has a bunch of crap on the walls. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're gonna have like a vintage living room in the corner for some reason, you know, uh, <laughs> are you gonna have a record player? Are you gonna have piles of apparel? Um, you know, those are all conscious choices. Maybe less so the apparel. It's just that we have nowhere else to put it. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the stuff we, we do here in terms of, you know, the decor, if you will, or the vibe, is because when we built this place, we were thinking about it as every angle that you would look is essentially a shot, right? And we want to have this sort of space where we can have multiple sets. Right? So the living room is a set. The gym area is a set. You know, the office is its own set. Maybe the kitchen, once it's a little more fleshed out, will be a kind of set. Yeah. And that allows us to have some more creativity and kind of mix things up with how we're filming things and angles and whatever. I feel like we still a have a long this. way to go. A, <laughs> a long way to go. Dylan doesn't believe in this shit, but I tell you, it works. The gym is slowly taking shape. We're finally filling it out. Probably over it. We got our art coming now. for the wall. Yeah, soon. getting the Shane artwork. just started working on that. My tattoo artist who's been doing my my back for a number of years just started yeah. a big uh, 10 feet wide by 6 feet tall wood panel. Yeah. Uh, painted wood. 
I thought it was gonna go up. I thought it'd be easier than it was and take less time to like set up all the spaces. To get everything looking the way we want. And I think that's something that can be <laughs> sometimes frustrating because it's like, yeah, the living room we want it to be sort of retro, but we're still missing a lot of pieces like a lamp and like- A better table. Like, yeah, I really <laughs> wanna like round it out so that when we film in that section, it really gives Feels you- Feels like its own thing. Yeah. yeah, and then we have to figure out like, how do you light it so that it looks sort of natural, like a, I don't know, 80s or 70s basement, but yeah, uh, it's, it's slowly getting there. I think once, <laughs> once we get there, it'll be probably time for our lease to be up. <laughs> I don't think, yeah, I was gonna say, I don't <laughs> think there is a getting there. It's, it's yeah. like any creative pursuit, it's just constantly a work in progress, right? Yeah. So but taking steps to being closer to that and making the environment that we want to, I don't know, shit, man, spend all of our time in Yeah. <laughs> every single day. <laughs> so, yeah. That's, that's all I got. Yeah, I think that's it. I think that's it too. Okay. Cool. Well, send it off. thanks for tuning in. Uh, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment. Notification bell. All those things. Tell your friends. Say, what's the secret word? So DM when, it to masses of people. We need a word so we know if people made it this far. <sighs> Probably like 5% made it this far. Mm -hmm. What's mm -hmm. the word? Um, shin bone. Okay, cool. Shin bone is the secret word. Dude. I think another thing we could start doing, and we, you mentioned this before, was when people put the secret word on stuff, we'll randomly select one and send them a shirt. Yeah. So we'll do that. We'll do that this week. <laughs> okay. we're, we'll, we'll trial it, right? Yeah. We'll see. But if anybody's still watching at the end of this video, after all that jabbering we just did for the last 20 minutes, if you're still watching, you comment shinbone down below. <laughs> maybe you get picked, maybe you win a shirt. Yeah, well, uh, maybe I'll say who wins and I'll pin that comment or something. Yeah. Just so you guys know that we're not, we're not capping, as the kids say. <laughs> no cap, no cap. This is for real, for real. <laughs> All right, we got to turn these things off before we devolve further. Yeah. Okay. Bye, Bye everybody.